morning, church. My name is Van Barnhill. I'm one of the associate pastors here at East Cooper Baptist. Thank you for being with us here this uh, beautiful morning to worship together. As we begin our time, uh, I just want to make note of a couple of announcements that you can find in your worship guides. Uh, just uh, kind of preemptively, I want to say uh, the gospel we read in the scriptures is a free gift. It is a wonderful, praiseworthy thing. Um, and it's not a gift that we harbor for ourselves, but it's one that we want to see perpetuated forward and sent out to the rest of the world, to the coming generations. Um, so just in light of that idea, I just want to make note of a couple things here in your worship guide. The first is we have an upcoming uh, conference at the end of this month called AWARE on April 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. And this is uh, an evening that is going to be spent around the concept of the idea of um, knowing how to... Um, love and, and lead and care for the coming generation, particularly Gen Z, Gen Alpha. So uh, whether or not you're a parent or a grandparent, um, even if you just have a broader uh, concern with wanting to know how to communicate and care for the coming generation, this is an evening for you. There will be child care available. We just ask that you register beforehand and you can see details on how to do that um, here and on our website. The second thing I want to bring up is, is a bit more long-term in perspective, and it's uh, something called our Legacy Fund. This is something that is in light of our, our vision initiatives here at the church, things that we want to do um, to be good stewards of what the Lord has provided for us. So this could be considered something akin to an endowment or a trust, but the idea would be that uh, the funds that are collected as a part of the Legacy Fund are for Great Commission missions initiatives in the years to come. Um, this would be something that's that's managed by a third-party group that uh, accumulates, and in the years and years and years to come, um, the the growth from that is is meant to see the gospel go forth um, in various ways. So there are some uh, small brochures like this at our welcome desk in the worship center with some information on who to get in touch with and where you can find out more information for that. Thank you so much. Let's continue to worship the Lord together.
On this third Sunday of Easter, we continue to celebrate the victory that is ours in Christ. Psalm 100 leads us. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. And so we gather to proclaim. Christ has died. Christ is risen. It is he who made us and not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And he created us to proclaim, Christ has come, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name and be grateful to proclaim, Christ has Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations and we continually proclaim Christ has Christ is risen Christ will All hail the power of Jesus' name. Sing his praise.
God, indeed, what a privilege we have to stand in your presence this morning and crown you Lord of all, glorious Lord of life. By the mighty resurrection of your Son, you overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in Christ. Grant that we who joyfully celebrate Christ rising from the dead may worship you in fullness of joy and be raised from the death of sin to a life of righteousness through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. And on this third Sunday of Easter, we continue to rejoice in resurrection life that knowing full well that Easter is full of joy and the laughter of love and the grave is empty, love is one, and Christ indeed has risen. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Psalm 34 calls us to magnify the Lord this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. For I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. And those who look to him are radiant. And their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is a man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I will bless the Lord at all times. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry? And then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. From rivers to the mountain tops, we hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. in me when every creature finds its inmost melody and every human heart is native cry and then in one in raptured hymn of praise we'll sing cry Stand strong and worship you, and if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. 
I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just a doorway to resurrection life. If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you. in our life. I hope that is our prayer today. Would you greet each other in the name of the Lord Church before you're seated. Good morning. Right now our congregation is greeting each other in worship and we wanted to take this opportunity to greet you on the live stream as well. Thank you for joining us. We do want to encourage you to be a part of your local church in person if you are able to do so. We believe that being together with God's people is of vital importance and we encourage you to worship weekly in a local body of believers. If you are new to our church, we encourage you to email us so we can get you some more information on the life of our church and maybe answer any questions you may have or pray for you with any needs you have. Thank you. Church, we have the privilege this morning of dedicating a little girl to the Lord. In the last hour, we had we had four little girls dedicated and no boys. And this, now this hour, this little girl. And I, I feel like we should have this the, the Father is Toast celebration right now. Because, you know, my experience, boys, you, you can deal with boys when it comes to girls. Fathers are just putty. So you're done. Justin, know that. So... So this is, let me introduce to you um, the Steedley family, um, and we have Natalie, who was born on May the 10th of 2022, and Walker, who, <laughs> when was Walker born? 2020. July of, 29th. Of 2020. 2020, 2020, 2020, okay. Um, and another brother up here. Carter, the oldest. So standing with them will be the Hun family. The Huns, they're in a community group together and uh, just they're representing us. So th this is a solemn moment. I mean, it is a wonderful celebration of life. It's a celebration of God's goodness. But it's also a, a tangible commitment of this mom and dad to raise their little girl and little boy in the way of the Lord. And the Huns represent us, so we're making a commitment to stand with them to encourage and raise and bless these children. Um, it's, it's a great celebration, but it's also a, a time of solemnity. So I'm going to ask the Steedleys a few questions. Do you pledge to raise this little girl and this little boy, these little boys in the way of the Lord? We do. Do you pledge to so love each other that your statement is a love that Jesus has for the church? And we seek to lead into faith in Christ at an early age. So I would ask you to Natalie to the Huns, but that may not be a good idea. You can try it. <laughs> Noble effort. Okay. 
I'm going to ask you to stand here and in the worship center as we make a pledge. I'm going to ask you a question. You will respond with, we will. Church, will you so live out the faith and the reality of Christ that your testimony points to the strong reality of the gospel of grace and the glory of Christ? We will. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. And it's, it's such an honor. It's a privilege to, to say that life is from the Lord. And it's, it's a blessing. Thank you for children. And I, I pray that as a church that we would have an incredible, insatiable, undeniable, forward-thinking attitude in raising the next generation and the next generation. I pray that you would surround this family with your mercy and your grace. I pray that the power of the risen Christ would be in their lives through the Holy Spirit. I pray that these children would come to faith at an early age and know the confidence and joy of their salvation. I pray that we as a church would, would ponder the words of Jesus who said, uh, it'd, be, it'd be better to have a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the depth of the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So we, we take that seriously. So give us grace to live with uh, a sense of rightness before them in Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations. Well, church, we're in this uh, series on hope, thinking about the hope of the gospel, the fact that we have hope because we have an Abba Father who is good, and everything we need for life and godliness and for eternity has been secured for us by the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And that the Holy Spirit applies these truths to our heart. And so this morning, the question is, what, what gets us up and keeps us going as believers? What gives us the, the motivational power to go forward under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Listen to a well-known passage in 2 Corinthians 4. I love this passage. This is Paul writing, and he says, we have this treasure in jars of clay, our bodies, to show that the all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. So, so Paul says, you know, we're struck down, yes. Life can be hard, but we're not destroyed. We are perplexed because life is sometimes hard to understand, but we never throw in the towel and give ourselves to despair. So in, in, in the difficulties of life, we keep going forward, he says, because we carry about in our body the reality of Jesus and his teachings. And Jesus says in John chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you so that you can come and be with me one day. So, so don't let your hearts be troubled because you have the hope of eternity. You have the, the hope of heaven. Paul is writing a letter to a healthy church. In the book of Ephesians, the church is filled with faith in Christ and love for the saints. A church that Paul says, I am incredibly thankful for you. And even in the midst of that blessed plenteousness, he prays this prayer. He says, I, I pray that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation to know him better. So that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. And the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That glorious inheritance, the hope of heaven. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I read these things. And I ponder this. 
And I've got to tell you that my thinking about and being motivated by the glory and hope of heaven is not what it should be. I can go for days, days and days, without stopping to say, heaven awaits. And, and when I do that, I short circuit the power of the Holy Spirit to teach me that which should motivate and push me along. So my, my, my thesis is that this blessed hope of Titus 2 that we'll read about in a second, this blessed hope is meant to undergird, push, carry, and inflame our passions. So I'm just going to read the passage in Titus. It's chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It's an incredible passage. It's the letter to the church in Crete. And Paul says this. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now the word sound is used three times in this passage, and it, it means health producing, that which means flourishing, that which is healthy. We get our word hygiene from this word sound. So what accords with sound doctrine, older men are to, to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, <clears throat> not slanderers or slaves, too much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. So, sound doctrine. And he uses the word good three times in this passage as well. And, and good means beautiful, handsome, fitting, advantageous. Again, sound, good, so that you can adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. And so I read this and I go, yes. And then I ask, what pushes this forward? What compels this type of living? And he answers it in the next two sentences. He says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting, waiting for the blessed hope, waiting for the happy hope, the happy blessed hope, the appearing of of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so the, the, the answer is this. What compels this type of living? In part, the grace of God has appeared, the glory of the cross. And we are waiting with expectation for the glory of heaven, the blessed happy hope. I, I read this, and I read the Bible, and I go, you know, there, there should be a sense of anticipation I mean, heaven awaits. It's, it's, it's glorious. And, and yet, it's easy to miss it. There's a quote in the bulletin from C.S. Lewis, and this is what he says, mere Christianity. He says, probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy our longing. There's a longing we have. But only to, to arouse it and to suggest the real thing awaits. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death, I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and help others to do the same. So, 
It's so easy to get it snowed under. It's so easy for the hope to be turned aside just, just because we don't think well and we don't think biblically and we're immersed in all this kind of stuff. And I, and I, I tell you to my shame that, that I, I do funerals and I see people die and I'm getting older and, and yet I, I don't think about heaven the way I should. When I read the Bible, there should be a sense of, of anticipation that, that, that gets our heart that says, glory awaits. This is, all top, this is God's gifts are here, but glory awaits. Yeah, it's kind of like a five-year-old anticipating Christmas Day on December the 20th. You know, December the 20th, how many days till Christmas? Five. Oh, man. The 21st, how many days? Four. Yeah. 22nd, three. December 23rd, two days. You dance. The 24th, you do jumping jacks and somersaults. Ah, just th this, type of, this type of anticipation. And I would just say to us, one thing I want to say this morning is do not let it get snowed under. Remind each other. Remind yourself. See, the Bible says that we groan. We covered that passage several times, Romans 8. We groan. But this hopeful groaning. Paul says, we groan, but we have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. So, so we have hopeful groaning. People outside of Christ just groan. My body's hurting. I'm getting older. They just groan. No, we, we groan with hope. Conversely, in the same way, the Bible says that we grieve, but not like those who have no hope. I mean, when you lose a loved one in the Lord, you grieve. Absolutely, but not like those who have no hope. In the world system, people just grieve. There's no hope. Example, Mark Twain. We've read some of his books growing up. Died in 19 and 10. He was, I think, 84 years old, 83. Lived a long life, lived a celebrated life. He was a riverboat captain in the Mississippi. He was part of the gold rush in the 1850s and 60s, lived in the West and from Hannibal, Missouri, and came back and was a celebrated author. In fact, when he died, he was so loved and applauded that the president of the United States, William Howard Taft, sent out a message about celebrating the life of Mark Twain and what he contributed to the life of his country. But in in his latter years, in 1980, excuse me, 1896, his daughter, age 24, died very suddenly. Her name was Susie. Broke his heart. Eight years later, his wife of 38 years passed away. Five years later, his another daughter that he loved, Jean, died. And the next year he died in 19 and 10. He wrote his autobiography. This is what Twain says in part. He says, the burden of pain, care, misery grows heavier year by year. At length, ambition is dead. Pride is dead. Vanity is dead. There remains only a longing for release from this life, basically. He had no hope. He was not a believer. Charles Darwin, well-known scientist, you know his story. Charles Darwin wrote late in his life, he says, you know, I, I used to love poetry and I used to love music. And I used to love beautiful vistas. But he says, my mind has changed in the last 20 to 30 years. Now, for many years, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. But it does not cause me, music does not cause me the exquisite delight it once formerly did. Close quote. Now, here, he's, again, he's outside of the reality of the living God who made the heavens and the earth. And I, I just, I, I read that and, and I think of someone else, a woman named Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael was raised in Ireland. Her dad died when she was very young. Her mom raised seven children. Uh, came from a very godly family. She sensed the call of God to missions when she was a young woman. She went to India 
and was there for 55 years, um, basically caring for young girls. Her, she felt her calling was to go to Hindu temples where young girls had been sold into prostitution by their parents. And she would rescue these girls and bring them into a, a home. She would train them, teach them the gospel, hopefully, and they received Jesus, teach them the skills so they could go out and they could support themselves. And she did that for 55 years for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young women and eventually young, young little boys. She's a wonderful woman. But what you don't realize is that 20 years before she died in 1951, she was out walking at night and fell into a pit and mangled her leg, broke her leg. It was improperly set. It was never right. She was bedridden for 20 years, and she lived in constant pain as she cared for these people in southern India. And yet she wrote late in her life. Listen to this. There is nothing dreadful or doubtful about the Christian life. It is meant to be one of continual joy. We are called to a settled happiness in the Lord whose joy is our strength. Settled happiness. Because God is good and heaven awaits. I, mean, I can't, the gospel is, is, is glorious. Kike Hilby, professor of Wheaton College, wrote 10 resolutions for mental health. And resolution number seven is this. I shall sometimes look back at the freshness of vision I had in childhood and try to be in the words of Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland, a child of pure, unclouded brow and dreaming eyes of wonder, close quote. In other words, he says, I don't want to lose the, the absolute joy and blessedness of life. So as I look at this, two considerations and then two points from this text. Consideration number one is this. Brothers and sisters, those of you who are in Christ, glory awaits. Glory awaits God's people. Here's a quote by C.S. Lewis from a book entitled The Problem of Pain. Just listen to it. It's in the worship guide. The ultimate, okay, ultimate settled happiness and security, which we all desire, God withholds from us by the very nature of the world. We live in a fallen world, see? We live in an already but not yet. He says, but, but joy and pleasure and merriment he has scattered broadcast. Love the sense. Our Father refreshes us on the journey with some pleasant ends but will not encourage us to mistake them for home. We rejoice in the, in the good gifts of God. I mean, life is filled with joys and sorrows. But there's an ache in us that says, we're not there yet. We're not there. It's not perfect. Augustine, I don't quote too many people. This is Augustine. This is so powerful to me. Augustine talks about him. He says, I was a rascally slave to my intellect. He said, I could read books. I could put them together. I could have arguments, but I was outside of Christ. And he says this, I, I enjoyed these arguments, not recognizing the source of whatever elements of truth and certainty they contain. I had turned my back to the light and my face to the things it illumined, and so no light played upon my own face or on the eyes that perceived them. He said, I, I, I was smart, but I didn't understand anything. So he said, here's the source of light. Here's the living God. Here's his gifts that he's given everywhere. He said, I looked at the gifts. I rejoiced in the gifts, but I turned my back on the one who gives the gifts. Therefore, my understanding was severely limited, and I just didn't get it. Glory awaits. Heaven awaits. Late in the 1990s, there was a movie starring the incredible actor named Jack Nicholson. It was entitled As Good As It Gets. And uh, <laughs> he was a man that had every psychosis known to, to humankind. He talked about being extremely obsessive compulsive. He spent a lot of time in the, in the office of his psychiatrist. It was a very entertaining movie. In the movie, though, Jack Nicholas 
I think it's Melvin Udall was his name in the movie, breaks, rushes into the office of a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist is having a session with someone sitting there with him. And he started blurting some things out. And the psychiatrist, he said, just stop. He said, can't you see I'm busy? I can't deal with you right now. Make an appointment. And he, and he throws up his hands and he walks out of the office into the waiting room. And there are 10 people waiting to see the psychiatrist. And he stops in the middle of the office and he looks around and he says, it's an incredible line. Who's to say this is not as good as it gets? And he walks out. And I, I know that's supposed to be a, a comedy. But to me, that's the haunting question that people ask. Is this as good as it gets? And for those outside of Christ, the answer is yes. For those in Christ, the answer is, is absolutely not. Glory awaits. Rejoice in the blessed hope. The, the second consideration is that th this hope protects us from cynicism and despair. Well, we don't ask too much of the world. We, we, we understand that life has fallen and relationships are hard and, and family systems are hard and, and, and it takes, protects us from, from despair. It's interesting that when you look back on your life that you realize that you grow up um, as a parent enjoying watching the things that your children watch. So when our kids were younger, um, there were certain things that watched. Now we have grandkids. My grandkids love this show called Grizzly and the Lemmings. And they are all over that. So I all know about Grizzly and the Lemmings. But growing up, my kids loved, um, what's it called, the princess, the princess movie about the, the mermaid, the little mermaid, thank you. Uh, but another show they loved was The Lion King. Do you remember The Lion King? I like The Lion King. I love the fact that when the, the, the lion dad picks up the sun, holds him up, and everybody starts celebrating. It's just a fun movie. But the high, the high point in The Lion King, had great music, was, was um, a song entitled The Circle of Life. And, and, you know, start singing, it's the circle of life, and the elephants are dancing, and the tigers are jumping up and down, and the lions are roaring, celebrating life, and then they go into something, supposed to be Swahili, um, not Akuma Matata, no, not that, but something like Swahili, yada, yada. and they're celebrating, and they, you listen to it, and you look at it, and what they're saying is, here's the circle of life, you live, you die, you become fertilizer, the grass grows. The animals eat it. They live. They die. They become fertilizer. See the circle of life. And that's supposed to celebrate you. And I, I, I remember, you know, think about that. Being fertilizer doesn't do it for me. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. That's what they're saying. I mean, that's what they're saying. You're, you're, you're fertilizer. What does it for me is resurrection bodies. What does it for me is a glory that I can only begin to imagine. What, what, what does it for me is the best meal I ever have will be 1,000 times more tasteful in glory. New heavens and new earth. The, the vistas are going to be so much more glorious. New heavens and new earth. No more pain. No more sorrow. Kids say, will there be pets in heaven? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean... Well, I've got a thousand questions about heaven. I love competition. But to compete, you have to have a loser and a winner. No losers in heaven. I don't know how that's going to happen. Maybe it's like four-year-old team ball. Everybody's a winner, you know? But, 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 but the, the, what does it for me? Resurrection body, hope, seeing the Lord in his glory, trying glory face to face. No need for lights because light will emanate from the glory of the Godhead. I mean, unbelievable. The best music you've ever heard, boom, so much better. See, it, it saves us. It, it gives us hope in the midst of a culture that has despair. This past Thursday, when I was thinking about this sermon, and on Thursday, uh, we had, if you were out of town this week, we had a, uh, 
biblical rain almost. We had three and a half inches of rain in parts of Charleston. There was a flash flood alert, and I got caught outside in the middle of it and got soaked. And it was just rainy, cloudy, dark, pouring. Then the next day, Friday, I get up, and I'm driving, and the sun is out, and the birds are singing, and the sky is blue like it is right now. And I just remember looking at the greens and going, look at these greens. Maybe just because Thursday was overcast, but the greens on Friday were like unbelievable. And I thought, heaven's going to be a lot like that. So, so I, I say to you, don't let it get it snowed under. It gives you perspective. It gives you hope. And as you grow older, you, you, you grow old with dignity and kindness because the best is yet to be. If you're not a believer this morning, you grew old. There, there's, I think despair and cynicism are just endemic to that mindset, but not us. Not us. Not those who walk under the shadow of the cross. So two considerations. The first is this. This hope leads us to renounce. It says the grace of God has appeared to all men. It trains us to renounce worldly passions and desires, ungodliness and worldly passions. We renounce. We just we say no to it because of the grace of the cross, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we renounce. Because of the hope of heaven, the blessed hope of heaven, we renounce. We say, no, I'm going to live for the glory of God because he is glorious, he is good, and his way is best, and we renounce it. If you have that hope, you renounce if you don't have that hope, you, you pull and you pull and you pull and you pull for everything you can possibly grab because it's all up to you. <clears throat> so we, we, we renounce. And there's a statement here again from a book called The Screwtape Letters by Lewis where he talks about <clears throat> the cumulative effect of sin. And he, this is supposedly a, a letter written from a senior demon to a junior demon. He says, you must <clears throat> remember that the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the believer from God. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light into the nothingness or darkness. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, and without signposts. Now, what he's saying is this. That the goal of the devil is to push us away from the living God. And any, he'll use any means. He'll, he'll use um, uh, binge-watching ESPN, binge-watching Netflix, not thinking about anything. He says, in that regard, murder is no better than nothingness because you're pushing someone away from the reality of God. So I just say, be, be very careful about the cumulative effect of unconfessed, unforsaken small sins. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 about anger. It says if, if you let the sin go down on your anger, you give the devil a foothold. I mean, anger. Anger's, yeah. An another way to imagine that is, is one person says it's like a handle. If you, if, if you are involved in ongoing, unconfessed, unforsaken sin, you don't glory in the cross and glory in the hope of heaven. It's like a handle pops out on your side and the devil can grab it. Can grab it. Handle here, handle there. So, so be very careful. The, the grace of God teaches us to say no, no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And it teaches us, secondly, to, to live out the life. It's, it's to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while you wait for the blessed hope. Now, self-controlled means sober thinking. It means to think well. It means that you think about the things that matter well. It means that you don't just trip along through life without stopping to, to evaluate. We're to be people of joyful sobriety. So sober-minded. And it says upright. The word upright, I think, means 
observable character. So as people look at your life, they say, man, he or she is honoring the Lord. They're trying, he's trying to do the right thing in the name of Christ. And then godly living is we reflect the character of God in the way we live our lives. So it, it trains us. The, the, the Holy Spirit takes the grace of the cross and the hope of heaven and trains us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Don't let the hope get snowed under with stuff. Say to one another, heaven awaits. Say to one another, life's a vapor. I mean, as you get older, you know, it's, it's amazing. You bury friends. You read history and you realize there's not a lot of people that you admire were dead by my age. But I don't think that I'm going to die tomorrow. I could. Life is a vapor. So we live that way. We live with that understanding. We live as people of hope. In the incredible trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, in the last book, the clouds are heavy. Defeat seems to be inescapable. And Aragorn and some of his men are talking. Aragorn's the king to be. Love Aragorn. And as they're talking, and as they're pondering their fate, which they think is not good, this is what it says. The narrator says, heavy would my heart have been if Legolas, Legolas is the elf, the son of the elfin king, if Legolas had not laughed suddenly saying, Oft hope is born when all is forlorn. I read that and I thought, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. That, that, that hope is born when you come to the place you say, this doesn't do it, this doesn't do it, this doesn't lead to flourishing, this is an empty promise, this won't go. The only thing that carries me along is the reality of the living God who in the fullness of time became a man and died on the cross for my sins. And, and, and this living God said, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I mean, I mean all, all, hope is forlorn. It's not there. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He doesn't say, come to me, all you are successful and wise and brilliant, have it all together, and there are the applause of the culture. No, all you are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. So, Hope is born when all is forlorn. The gospel always holds out hope. Don't let it get snowed under. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the thank you for the, being able to open the Bible and hear your thoughts for our hearts and our lives. Thank you that the grace of God teaches us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and it trains us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age as we wait for the happy, blessed appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I just pray we remind each other frequently that there is an eternity, and that eternity is so joyful, so glorious, that the Apostle Paul says this, to, 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 to depart and be with Christ is better by far. Same passage, he says, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain, gain. So let, let those words encourage and build and strengthen and carry us along. In Jesus' name. As we respond to God's word, let's stand and sing as Jennifer leads us in, Let Your Kingdom Come. Wherever we are, we ask God.
courage to speak, perform your wondrous deeds through those who are weak. Lord, use us as you want, whatever the test, by grace we'll preach your gospel to our dying. make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. Thank you for worshiping with us today.